Good, mo <clears throat> Good morning, friends. Today is Pentecost Sunday. On this day, the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples of Jesus who had gathered in Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit came upon them, and the power of heaven's love filled them. And from that time and place, the disciples went out and turned the world upside down. Now, friends, I invite those who are able to rise and let us sing our opening hymn. On Pentecost they gathered. It's hymn number 225. <laughs> Friends, it is true we are not perfect. We make mistakes. We sin. We do not do what it is God wants us to be doing in our lives. And because of that, we come to God in a time of confession. Let us use the words printed in the bulletin and offer our prayer. Let us pray. 
Amazing God, we are bewildered by our continuing inability to make sense out of life. Our visions and dreams far outpace reality, and our expectations of ourselves are seldom realized. We do not do the good we intend, and the evil thought we leave behind, left behind comes back to haunt us. In our relations with others, there seems to be no common language to unite us, and we resist including everyone in our concerns. Forgive our sluggish responses and our resistance to change. Purify and enliven us by your spirit at work within and among us. Amen. Friends, the good news of the gospel is this, that God does not wish to hold anything against any of God's children and is more than ready to forgive those who are truly repentant. And not only will God forgive us our sin, but as the psalmist reminds us, God removes our sin from us as far as the east is from the west and remembers it no more. Truly, this is the good news of the gospel. In response to this good news, I would invite those who are able to rise and let us sing together the Gloria Patri. <laughs> Before I read the scripture text for us today, I would like to invite us to, into a time of prayer. Let us pray. Well, God, we give you thanks for all of your words to us and for us. May your Holy Spirit be with us to open our minds and our hearts to all that the scriptures have to say to us this day. Help us to walk ever closer and closer to you as disciples of your son, Jesus. Bless us that we may be a blessing to others. In Christ's name we pray it. Amen. Now friends, our scripture reading for today comes from the second chapter of the book of Acts. I'll begin reading at the first verse. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard the sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language. Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongue. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they've had too much wine. 
Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. Why, it's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Here ends our reading from our scripture text this day. May God's spirit be with us as we seek both to understand its meaning for us as followers of Jesus and uh, to allow it to inspire us to be more faithful in our discipleship. Amen. There is no clearer before and after picture of the disciples of Jesus than what happens on the day of Pentecost. Prior to Pentecost, uh, that uh, celebration described in our text for today, even before the resurrection, even before the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, before these events, the disciples experienced the living presence of Jesus of Nazareth. And let me add, they were enthralled. 
They were his students. They listened carefully to what he taught. Oh, perhaps they didn't understand everything he said, and they certainly couldn't have applied everything they heard to their lives. But as I say, they were enthralled. Then he was crucified. He was dead and buried. And even though they were the first to experience the resurrection, they didn't fully understand what that could mean for them. In fact, after the resurrection, Jesus had told them to wait in Jerusalem. So they waited. That's the before picture. If a photograph could have been taken of them, they probably would have appeared to have a questioning look on their faces. And, okay, what do we do now? Kind of look. That was before Pentecost. What they didn't know is how Pentecost was about to change them. For they were about to be clothed with power from on high. Now, Pentecost is a Jewish festival. It is also known as the Festival of Weeks. There are two growing seasons in Palestine, one in the fall and one in the spring. And when the harvest comes for one or the other, it is a cause for great celebration. And in the Jewish religion, Pentecost comes 50 days after Passover. I suspect that the disciples of Jesus had gathered in Jerusalem for Pentecost and sought each other out, getting together in those places where they had previously met. Now, Pentecost usually arrives in late spring or early summer. And when Pentecost arrived 50 days following the resurrection of Jesus, his disciples were about to get a crash course in heavenly power. It began with the wind. You probably remember what Jesus had told Nicodemus about the Holy Spirit. He told Nicodemus that the wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is of everyone born of the Spirit. Following the wind of Pentecost described in our text for today, there came heavenly flames which came to rest on the disciples. Apparently they, like Jesus, were about to set the world on fire. That was proved by what they then spoke. They may have been speaking in their native Galilean speech, but what those who were present heard was something entirely different. The words they heard were in their own native languages, like Latin and Greek, Arabian and Egyptian. Those listening were astounded. If we had been there, we would have been astounded too. I mean, how would our video technician, Brian Baker, had he been there, how might he have responded? I can imagine him thinking, looking at his equipment, hmm, something must be wrong with this equipment. And these people from all over the ancient Mediterranean world wondered, what does this mean? And you and I may be wondering the same thing. What does this mean for you and me? You can picture, can't you, people outside the building suddenly crowding in. They cocked their heads and listened, trying to make sense of whatever was going on. What we know and what they didn't know is that the Holy Spirit is a phenomenal linguist and is able to communicate with people everywhere. These people were baffled here was something that bypassed human reasoning. Some people present tried to dismiss what was going on by suggesting that these disciples of Jesus were drunk. But Peter suggested, nah, they're not drunk. 
Why, it's only nine o'clock in the morning. No one gets drunk so early in the day. And then it hit Peter. A scripture text from the prophet Joel suddenly leaped into his mind. And do not discount such a thing, my friends, for this is often how the Holy Spirit works in your life and in mine. The words to a scripture text will suddenly hit us like they say, will hit us like a ton of bricks. And so Peter preached the first sermon of his life. He talked about the Spirit being poured out upon people. According to our scripture text for today, 3,000 people were touched by what Peter had to say. So touched, in fact, that they, like the 11 disciples, wanted to become followers of Jesus too. It was a miraculous response. Many scholars think of this occasion as the birthday of the church. It certainly was a new beginning in life of the 11 and in the lives of those who responded that day. They would be the first fruits of those who would go out and turn the world upside down. Yes, what happened in that place spread throughout Judea and Samaria and Galilee and on into Alexandria and Egypt and on into Ethiopia and Arabia and then on to, into the cities of what today is Turkey, cities like Laodicea and Ephesus and Macedonia and from there on into the nation of Greece and still on into the nation of Rome. And because of what happened in Jerusalem on Pentecost, the story of Jesus has been spread all around the world. All this happened by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now the scriptures speak about the Holy Spirit in at least two different ways. First, the scriptures speak of the Holy Spirit as the abiding presence of God in Jesus Christ with all the safety and comfort that that presence brings us. This is the spirit most of us know and love, for it brings peace and comfort into our lives. It soothes our souls, it revives the weary, it is always with us, especially when we have the good sense to breathe in and turn our faces to heaven and say, Thank you, God. Uh, but there is a second way the Holy Spirit is manifested in our lives as followers of Jesus. And this way is not nearly so comforting. This is the Spirit which, like the wind, howls down the chimney, which blows through the backyard and scatters the lawn furniture all over. Ask Job. And he'll tell you it's like a tornado. Ask Ezekiel, and he'll tell you it knits dry, dead bones back together and breathes new life into dead bodies. Or ask Peter, James, and John, and they'll tell you it transforms someone from an ordinary human body into a vision of heavenly light. Now, friends, something like that happened to me. Before I met Patricia, I was very skeptical of the relatively new movement within Christianity called Pentecostalism. However, after we had been dating for a while, and she began to attend the church where I was the pastor on Sunday mornings, I thought it only fair that I attend the Pentecostal church where she was a member on Sunday evenings. Now, their services were different from what I was accustomed to. For instance, they began at 7 o'clock, and sometimes we got over, oh, early, you know, like 9 o'clock. At other times, it went on until about 9.30. There was a band which was led by a pianist and included guitarists and a drummer and sometimes a saxophonist and a flautist. There were never fewer than three in the band. 
We sang and we clapped and we raised our hands in the air. Meanwhile, the children wandered throughout the sanctuary. They crawled underneath the pews to play or read or color in their coloring books, while their parents praised God and danced in place. And when the children uh, uh, tired, they often fell asleep on the pews right next to their parents. There were moments when someone spoke out loud in a strange tongue, and others in the congregation told everyone else what they'd said, what they'd heard. People came forward where hands were laid on their heads and shoulders, and everyone prayed for them. Some were, as they say, slain in the spirit and fainted away. The elders of the church caught them as they fell and gently laid them on the carpeted floor. It was like being in the midst of a thunderstorm. When I first started attending, I secretly prayed that lightning would not strike me, thank you very much. <laughs> Later I became more open. My initial response, I imagine, must have been something like what was going on for those people gathered in that place where Peter preached his first sermon on Pentecost and everyone who was there wondered, what in the world is going on? Now, am I the only one here this morning who would have reacted like this? I see a couple of hands. Who else wants an umbrella when it looks like the spirit is about to start coming down with wind and with fire? I can tell you who. I suspect that's precisely where the disciples were that day. And that's where we are many uh, more times than we'd like to admit. That's where we often are as individuals and as members of this body, the Church of Jesus Christ, born on that day that we call Pentecost. Now, friends, it's no crime to pray for a gentle spirit, to ask God to restore predictability to our lives, to remove us from areas of risk, to give us back the comfortable illusion of control so that we can sleep soundly at night. But my friends, Pentecost is our reminder that there is another side to God's Spirit. One that sets us on fire. One that transforms our lives, that turns our world upside down. This side of the Spirit is not predictable. It asks us to take risks on behalf of God and Jesus. To step out of the ordinary and embrace the ways of God, which are beyond our ability to control. Like Job and the whirlwind. Like Ezekiel who watched dry bones come to life. Like Peter, James, and John who saw a whole other side to the person of Jesus when he was transfigured. Or like me, he was introduced to a whole other style of worship on Sunday evenings. About the only thing a person can do when the Holy Spirit blows in our lives, in the face of such storms, about the only thing that you and I can do is fold up our umbrellas and put them away and open ourselves to the movement of the Holy Spirit. In doing so, my friends, in allowing ourselves to be directed by the Spirit of God, like the disciples in today's text, we will be clothed with heavenly power from on high. May each and every one of you be so blessed. Amen.
Let us pray. Well, God, we thank you for your presence with us this day as we gather for worship in this space. We pray that your spirit will open us to heaven's truth. Guide us in the ways of Jesus, renew our spirits, and help us to see your presence more clearly each and every day. And uh, Lord, when selfish and rebellious thoughts invade us, may your Holy Spirit restore us to obedience to your will and your ways. Oh God, we seek your help and your comfort in the midst of the anxieties that we face in life and the challenges that lie before us. May your Holy Spirit guide us through these difficult moments. And we pray that as followers of your son Jesus, with our reliance on the Holy Spirit, that our lives may produce good fruit and that we may experience things like joy, peace, and patience, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control, and share them with others so that they too will want those same things for themselves. Oh God, right now, there's a lot of violence going on in our world and in our nation. We pray that your Holy Spirit will be at work in Palestine, and uh, we pray that peace may be restored between uh, the people of Pal Palestine, the Palestinians, and the people of Israel. And may they not have to resort to violence. And we pray, O oh God, that your spirit will be with the citizens, uh, not only of this nation, but of other nations all around the world. And that uh, your spirit can help us to resolve whatever differences we may have without turning to violence. Oh God, we lift up prayers for a number of people today who need a healing, who need your healing presence. We lift up prayers for Teddy and Paul Neron and Paul Wise and Joni and Joyce and Lois, Jeff and Diane. We pray for Lisa and Wanda and Dave you know, O oh God, what each of these persons needs most. You know what their hopes and dreams are. And we pray that your spirit would grant them the desires of their hearts. We also pray that you'll be with the president of these United States of America and with the leaders of other nations all around the globe. May your Holy Spirit Guide them in the ways of peace with justice. And now, O oh God, in the silence of these moments, each and every one of us comes to you with our own thoughts and prayers and petitions. And now hear us, O God, as we lift to you the words to the prayer which Jesus himself taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Friends go out into the world and work to bring forth new life. Pay attention to heaven's dreams. Open your eyes to heaven's visions. Speak of God's goodness. Show others the presence of God's love. And may the God who breathed life into creation be your delight, both now and forevermore. Amen.